Hi everyone, me again, Laszlo Montgomery, another day, another Chung Yu, and I'm happy to bring you once again another staple from the annals of great Chinese sayings. This Chung Yu was even used by the late great James Clavell, mentioned in Noble House, if I recall correctly. Maybe Taipan also, who knows? This one's useful in all kinds of situations. And as usual, only four characters involved. Our Chinese saying is jiu niu yi mao. And without further wasting of precious time before we commence the telling of the story, allow me to break it down for you. Jiu niu yi mao. Jiu is the number nine. Niu means an ox or a cow. Jiu niu, nine oxen. Yi is the number one. And mao, aside from being the character for Chairman Mao, it also means a feather, or fur, or hair in this case. Yi mao, one hair. Nine oxen, one hair. Well, well, what could that mean? Jiu niu, yi mao. Let's go find out. From a document called Bao Ren Shao Qing Shu, we get this well-worn classic story that stars none other than the grand historian Sima Qian himself. We remember him, of course, for his achievement in completing the great work started by his father, the record of the grand historian, the Shi Ji. And if not for this text, written way back in the Han Dynasty, there would be a lot of blank spaces in the annals of Chinese history going back to the beginning. This story takes place during the time of one of China's greatest emperors, the Han Emperor Wu, Han Wu Di. This martial emperor had a major hand in stretching China's borders out beyond the traditional Yellow River Valley and its tributaries, and he did this mainly through conquest and to a lesser extent by diplomacy. And one of his generals was named Li Ling. He had done well as a Han general and worked his way up the military ladder. And during the early part of Emperor Wu's 54-year reign from 141 to 87 BC, he had decided, after so many incursions into Han China by the marauding Xiongnu, that it was high time to hit back against them. The Xiongnu are often referred to in the history books as the Huns, but they were a tribal confederation who thrived on the Mongolian steppe, north of everything happening along the Yellow River and the central plain of China. And they had been a stone in China's boot for a long time. And Emperor Wu made up his mind to once and for all push them back north and out of these lands bordering China. General Li Ling was ordered to provide backup support for the great general Li Guangli, who was given overall command in dealing with these fierce nomads of the steppe. Li Guangli was a favorite of Emperor Wu, thanks to his sister being the emperor's favorite concubine. Li Ling was kind of hoping to get his own command, and had spoken up too soon and overconfidently about all the damage he'd be able to do on his own with only 5,000 crack troops. He said he'd deal decisively with these Xiongnu barbarians and to just leave it to him. To make a long story short, the emperor gave him the okay, and even though he knew it was risky and that he probably shouldn't have acted so cocky, Li Ling rode off in the direction of the Tian Shan Mountains that ran north of Xinjiang, running to the west into Kyrgyzstan and Uzbekistan. Well, Li Ling sort of walked right into a buzzsaw. He had expressed too much optimism to the emperor as far as how easy it was going to be to give the Xiongnu a licking. When he encountered the Xiongnu army, he found himself grossly outnumbered. And even though he hung in there a while and inflicted a great amount of pain and suffering on the Xiongnu army, in the end, he was soundly defeated and captured by the Xiongnu. Well, the way it worked in those days, when you got an order direct from the emperor, and you failed, <laughs> you had best fall on your sword, because your career was, for all intents and purposes, over. Instead of killing himself, Li Ling opted to defect and live out the rest of his days amongst the Xiongnu and help train their military. 
when word got back to Han Wu Di about the loss in battle. He was livid, to say the least. And reading the Emperor's mood correctly, all of Li Ling's detractors at court piled on and dissed him in front of the Emperor, and everyone took turns putting their sword into Li Ling. And while everyone at the palace was giving their two cents to the Emperor and painting Li Ling's defeat in the worst possible light, Sima Qian stood by silently, not saying anything. Li Ling had always been a friend and political ally of his, so he opted not to stick a knife in his back. The Han Emperor Wu turned to Sima Qian and asked his illustrious palace historian what did he think about the whole thing. Well, he should have just gone along with what everyone else was saying because it was pretty evident Li Ling was cruising for a bruising with Han Wu Di over the whole defeat. The emperor hadn't heard yet about the defection. That came later. And when he found out, the emperor would order the summary execution of Li Ling's wife and mother. That was a harsh, unforgiving time back then. Well, Sima Qian, instead of going with the flow, defended Li Ling and said... Even though he fell to the Xiongnu, he had always served well in the past and had many victories under his belt. He continued that Li's army of 5,000 faced off against tens of thousands of Xiongnu mounted soldiers. True, he had been annihilated, but he had lasted more than 10 days in battle and had killed thousands more of the Xiongnu. He said that they shouldn't discount the notion that perhaps he willingly surrendered so that he might regain his strength, and when the time was right, avenge the country and conquer the Xiongnu. Sima Qian had even inferred, in a roundabout way, that Emperor Wu's favorite, Li Guangli, hadn't fared too well against the Xiongnu either, and once he let that slip out, <laughs> that was it. The emperor put his foot down and charged Sima Qian with insulting the royal person with his remarks. The penalty was a fine that Sima Qian, at his annual salary, could hardly afford to pay. So he was given the option to be executed or be castrated and serve three years in prison. Yeah, not a particularly attractive couple of choices. As Sima Qian sat in his jail cell, he contemplated his fate. His friends came by to visit him and tried to offer solace. He told one of his closest colleagues that it remained of paramount importance that he complete this great historical work he had been working on, the as-yet-unfinished records of the Grand Historian, the Shi. He came to the realization that if he died before finishing this work that his father Sima Tan had begun, his disgrace would be even greater than the castration. Without completing this work... Aside from disgracing his father's memory, his death would be as meaningless and insignificant as the loss of a single hair from a total of nine oxen. Jionyo, Imao, it was a drop in the bucket. If his death had the meaning of a single hair from nine oxen, it meant his death would be as significant as the loss of one hair from the back of an oxen. It would have absolutely no impact whatsoever on the way the world turned. He would die, failing to leave his mark, and his whole life would have been utterly meaningless and forgotten in no time, like a single hair lost from nine oxen. So Sima Qian, China's most respected and renowned historian from ancient times, went through with the castration and lived out the rest of his life as a eunuch in the imperial palace. They weren't terribly respected in the palace hierarchy, though many, of course, attained stratospheric amounts of power and wealth. So Sima Qian carried on his work, stigmatized by this public shame he carried wherever he went because of the particular punishment meted out to him for his verbal transgression. But on the other hand, here we are, almost 2,000 years later, and his fame and renown at least in China, and with those who study China, is still very much alive and celebrated. And had he allowed himself to be executed, he never would have finished the great work for which he is immortalized. We would have no memory of him, and indeed, his life would have been 
worth no more than a single hair from nine oxen. It wouldn't have mattered. And whenever you want to show something is quantitatively insignificant, a drop in the bucket, as we say, using the English idiom, of no importance, you can say, yeah, it's nothing more than a single hair taken from nine oxen. Utterly useless. Something no one would miss. To express the magnitude of anything as being utterly insignificant and too small to even count for anything, you can use jionyo imao. Works every time. And that's all I have for you today. Jionyo imao, a single hair from nine oxen. A classic Chinese saying, if there ever was one, and made even more memorable because the backstory for this Chengyu concerns the great Sima Qian, one of the patron saints, I may add, of the CHP, the China History Podcast. Hundreds of hours of programs covering Chinese history from mythical times to the present day. Go check that out at Teacup. Dot media, if you haven't already, of course. There you'll find plenty of ways to support me if you're so inclined. Well, that's going to be it. Once again, I'd like to thank Emma on behalf of the group and ourselves, and I hope we pass the audition. She's holding down the fort in Edinburgh at the Chengyu Yanqiu Zhongxin, being as indispensable as she ever was. Thanks, Emma. Take care, everyone. This is Laszlo Montgomery wishing all y'alls the very best and encouraging you to come back next time for another practical episode of the Chinese Sayings Podcast.